Good evening, people of Melbourne. Welcome to The Cutting Room. I'm your host, Guy Cunningham. Hello, I'm Sarah Bliss. And hello, I'm Courtney Holder. Tonight, we'll investigate YouTube. Launched in 2005, the video sharing platform was an instant hit with an enormous amount of free content. Not only did it provide a huge pool of diverse videos, but if you yourself were a content creator, the platform was easily accessible, with creators from all walks of life contributing. But is it truly a media for the people? To find out, we sent James McLean into the field to talk to Melbourne comedy trio Swag on the Beat. And special guest Deborah Ruth lends us their expert opinion to also weigh in on the matter. But before that, some news headlines. The death of Queen Elizabeth II last week prompted commercial TV and radio to abandon its regular scheduling, including advertising, as it covered events live in the UK. Even Google went grey in her honour. No stranger to the media, Elizabeth gave a live wartime radio address to the nation at the age of 14. Her 1953 coronation was the first ever to be publicly viewed live in colour on TV. The royals were also the original targets of the infamous print media snappers, the paparazzi. Elizabeth's life became the focus of the epic tell-all Netflix series, The Crown, which garnered her a new generation of admirers. Back home, the removal of Australian-made children's content quotas from commercial TV has led to a dramatic drop in homegrown kids' shows going to air. A report this month from the Australian Communications and Media Authority revealed that in 2021, when quotas were abandoned, Channel 10 reduced their Australian children's content by 50% and Channel 7 by 80%. Only 6.5% of Seven's kids' shows were locally produced. Industry body Screen Producers Australia stated, with a third of Australian households not paying for streaming, children in these homes are increasingly locked out of seeing their own unique stories. Meta has copped a $402 million fine for the mishandling of a teenager's data. Ireland's Data Protection Commission finalised the decision early this month after pursuing the investigation for almost two years. The breach of GDPR rules involved Instagram allowing users below the age of 18 to identify as business accounts. As business accounts are public, this results in the exposure of personal details, such as email addresses and phone numbers. This is the third and largest fine the DPC has imposed on Meta and comes only months after the EU passed further regulations on big tech. Adam Mossery, head of Instagram, has proposed an age-appropriate version of the platform to resolve data concerns moving forward. Meanwhile, not-for-profit organisation Consent Labs is calling for a new TV and film classification after a study found that over half of a cohort of a thousand Australian viewers couldn't identify non-consexual sex scenes. Many participants identified consent as body movement, a look or a feeling. Consent Labs argue that in real life, consent must be given verbally, which is often absent in film and TV, including hugely popular shows like Bridgerton. They are now applying to the classification board to implement a warning of a non-consexual sex scene. CEO Angelique Wan stated, Media is incredibly powerful in shaping our understandings and expectations of what sexual activity should look like. In turn, young people are normalising their absence of consent. YouTube continues to lean into the enormous success of video podcasts, with content creators looking to merge their audio-only projects to the video format. It brings direct competition to Spotify. Dad to Spotify's headaches are talks of TikTok also tossing their hat into the ring of podcast distribution. Some of the more traditional artists, however, feel that there is a certain je ne sais quoi to audio that may get lost in the merge to video. To compete, Spotify will allow creators to monetize the same way they would with video via subscription. But with little overlap in audience, the move to visual content will likely continue. In gaming news, more details have emerged from the fallout of the Lord of the Rings MMO. The game's development was cancelled last year due to Amazon and Tencent refusing to see eye to eye about profit distribution. Two giant corporations with two giant licenses couldn't get along. Who figured? Despite this, Tencent will, has still been showing interest in Western gaming developers. Its most recent move was a $45 million investment in the Guillermo Brothers. Given that investment doesn't include board seats or ownership, it sets a precedent that Tencent has enormous financial power that it will use to influence the gaming industry. For us gamers, we still have Gollum to look forward to. Daedalic Entertainment hopes to confirm a release date in the coming months. And that's this week's news, but don't click anything. We'll be back with more Cutting Room after the break.
Welcome back. This week we put YouTube in the spotlight. Its name basically means TV about you in early 21st century American. 17 years after it revolutionized the internet, more than two and a half billion people worldwide use YouTube once a month, raising about $29 billion in advertising revenue. But is YouTube used for good or evil? Maddie Weeks considers the evidence. On Valentine's Day 2005, three guys who met working at PayPal registered YouTube as a website. Chad Hurley, Steve Chen and George Karim wanted a platform for ordinary people to share homemade videos, including their own. George Karim made and starred in the first ever video uploaded, and it kicked off a quiet revolution. People began making and sharing what they wanted on YouTube, and as word spread, viewer numbers expanded. That many eyeballs is like catnip for brands and advertisers. The first ever video to go viral, notching up one million views, was a Nike ad featuring Brazilian soccer star Ronaldinho. YouTube, the little garage startup, sold to Google when it was about a year and a half old for 1.65 billion US dollars. Soon, even content creators could make money on YouTube. When baby Charlie and his brother broke the internet in 2007, the family reportedly made 100,000 US dollars, and that's around the same time ads were enabled on the platform. But YouTube was about more than money. It had a crucial role in the so-called Arab Spring protests of the early 2010s. Ordinary people protesting authoritarian or corrupt governments shared uncensored messages and videos on YouTube, which raised awareness around the world. Governments fell, but lessons were learned, and soon social media freedoms dwindled in some countries, whilst elsewhere few restrictions allowed the spread of fake news along with extremist and violent views. In March 2019, an Australian white supremacist shot 51 people dead at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, live streaming the massacres on Facebook. A Royal Commission later found that the shooter had been radicalised by material available on YouTube. YouTube claims to have improved its processes to weed out Islamophobic material, but all it takes is a quick Google search to find something divisive. YouTube is under pressure to crack down on fake news about COVID and Donald Trump's claims about the US election result, which he definitely lost, but his denials fueled the US Capitol riots that killed five people. All that Riot Vision did was help authorities track down the people involved, and as it turns out, it's the kind of proof that's hard to argue against in court. It appears the platform made for the people by the people has had brief and shining moments as a force for good, but it's also been corrupted. Maybe it's time for the people to reclaim YouTube. If only there was a way to get comedians to lead the fight. Uh, we are here with Swag on the Beat. We've got uh, Isaac, we've got Jack, we've got Sam. Thank you very much Which for joining us. Did you say that in? Yeah. We've got Jack, Sam and Isaac. That's what we're Happy to be here. Thank you, thank you. And me. Happy to be here. Thank room. you for joining us on The Cutting Room. Yeah. Uh, so, as YouTube uh, content creators, when did you start producing content for YouTube? About six months ago. Um, we started putting up our content that was originally on like Instagram, TikTok, social media stuff onto YouTube. And we also started doing a music guitar show or a music interview show where we get Australian and international musicians and just ask them silly questions, play games yeah, we, and jam. We lost our job, so we just thought, what else are we gonna do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about your channel? Like, wh Why did you want to start making this sort of, this sort of show? I think we were sort of trying to fill the gap uh, for an Australian music show that was sort of around when we were kids in the early 2000s, like um, Recovery and Raid and stuff and Countdown in the 80s and those were, I feel like there's not a lot of that at the moment, so we thought we'd make a really bad show that doesn't do well and not fill that void at all. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But we'll keep trying. Yeah, and that's nah, the thing. It's we, actually pretty good. We will never give up. We'll <laughs> yeah. never give up. Um, how do you find YouTube different from the other platforms that you've produced for? Um, I think the algorithm's a little bit different in terms of what does well. 
Yeah. And also, I think we well we sort of we sort of post interviews rather than sketches. So I feel like that's pretty different as well with uh, what, what we're sort of aiming for. We're not we're not going out like with our sketches and that we're trying to do really well and get good views and sort of appeal to a wider ones where the interview show is probably more niche. It's like people who are interested in both music and, and sort of we're trying to combine the two of music and comedy in the show. So we have like fun segments where we um yeah, where we sort of ask stupid questions or play fun games. But yeah. yeah. I don't know if that answers the question at all. Probably doesn't. <laughs> well, we found that the, the success on uh, Instagram and, and TikTok doesn't definitely doesn't equate to success on YouTube. Yeah. There's a huge um, disconnect there with content that does well on each. So, like, we're still in the development stages because we're early to YouTube now to work yeah. out what that is. And um, I think that's just a matter of trial and error and, and sort of going for different paths to work it out. But, you know... Um, we're getting traction now-ish. Uh, how important in the content that you produce, how important is continuity to you guys? Making oh, sure it's... everything looks consistent between shot to oh, shot. It's very, uh, very, you would believe. very, yeah. I mean, we try and get at least the, the angles right so that people are looking in the right direction. Mm. But a lot of the time you'll find if something it doesn't have continuity, that'll incite comments and interest from the viewers. So sometimes we purposely misplace things or have something happening. Like Sam's an expert of the background guy. It's not very hard. Right, so a scene will be happening, but he'll be walking behind both characters at the same time. It's so complicated. And, 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 you know, it's things like that that really set us yeah. apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we just, the things like the background thing, I mean, it gives you something else to look at. So it's just kind of unexpected. And then when you're focusing on one thing, you can kind of just look at another thing that's also occurring at the same time. Mm. And sort of, I don't think anyone else is really doing that except for us and maybe a couple of other people. Yeah. So that's about- There's a couple about, of guys doing it. Yeah. But yeah. I haven't seen anyone yet. So that's kind of the main thing. Yeah. That, for the three of you, um, so Isaac, Jack and Sam, how does it feel to be the only one whose name doesn't rhyme with that? <laughs> This is actually I a mean, pretty contentious point. I mean, I get so, yeah. bullied a lot, but that's got nothing to do with questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I think about it, just not us, just probably every day when I go home. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm working on it. It has I think been hard for us, very hard. I yeah. think hard work. Really, really we really we hard. considered, um, we trialed he changing his name to Sack. <laughs> but um, obviously, for... And we tried getting Kojak, the gorilla from Tarzan, <laughs> but he wasn't keen to be yeah, a yeah. part of it. And I couldn't change it to Barack. No, that's probably that's a bit <laughs> on the nose. And is there anything that you're excited about, um, sort of, at all? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to the beach in a few weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. After that, uh, I've got a roll up in my bag. I'll have after oh, this. Dude, Cheers. 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 <laughs> Say that. Say the roll. <laughs> okay. Sorry, cancel that. Got a muesli bar. Uh, dude, you definitely can't say that. Uh, what um, am I? What are we excited, excited about? about? We got we got projects um, in the works at the moment. That we may or may not be like ready to share because we're so we, early we stages. Share. Yeah. Um, but no, we won't. but then if no one comes to see them, exactly. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't matter at all. But there's a lot of viewers of this show, so I don't want to disappoint anyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, some, something may or may not happen. That's a thing. All right. At some point in we'll time. Also, just viewers, this stays between you and us. Don't. This goes no further. But we're considering writing for a five show. And um, um, we might have to say it louder than that. <laughs> yeah, for a live. <laughs> you didn't give anything. Like <laughs> yeah, we're trying to do a live show, but uh, you know the process of writing that's really fun, and we just have as many projects as possible happening at any given time because you just need, you know, one might work, one might not work. Cool. Well, thank you very much for joining us, guys. This has been Swag on the Beat. On it. Thank you. I'll, I'll get it. Thanks, cheers. Thank Thanks, you guys. very much. And back to the studio. We love Channel 31. See you back in the studio. studio. RMI TV. See you back in the studio. The cutting room. This is I'm the cutting room. room. Welcome to the cutting room. It's going to cut now. Cut it now. Well, YouTube does make all our episodes available worldwide, so it can't be that bad. Viewers, stick with us. We'll be back with more after this short break.
Welcome back to The Cutting Room. Today we have special guest Deborah Ruth joining us to discuss all things YouTube-y. To get to know Deborah's amazing career, let's go to field reporter James McLean. Joining us in the studio this week is Deborah Ruth, a mental well-being artist, author and coach from Melbourne. She specialises in drawing meditations and using the mind, body and spirit to unlock our full potential. Deb is a firm believer in the power of art to heal, transform and change people and places for the better. She coaches others into finding their true power by focusing on what separates them from the herd. During the intense lockdowns, she founded her YouTube channel, Thought Temple. The channel has amassed almost 15,000 subscribers and is centred around the stories we tell ourselves and the stories others have told us, that we buy into and hold us back both creatively and in life. Her channel is dedicated to inspiring and motivating individuals to believe in themselves, to accept and cherish their differences, and to challenge their thought patterns. We look forward to having Deborah join us on The Cutting Room to further discuss her holistic approach to self-discovery. Hi Deborah, thank you for joining us. Hello, <laughs> and thank you for having me here. It's good to have you in. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about Thought Temple. Why did, why did you make this YouTube channel? Thought Temple um, is a creation of the stories that we tell ourselves, the stories that other people tell us, and the stories that we buy into because right from when we're quite young, we are told things and we never ever question those beliefs. A lot of the things that we're told are actually quite negative and limit us. So Thought Temple was all about changing those thoughts and those thought patterns visually. So I chose to do it through video and to actually start to change thought patterns into a more positive story to tell yourself rather than one that is limited and negative and stops you from actually doing what you really want to do in life and to reach your potential. Was there any particular event in your life that may have inspired you to, to start Thought Temple? Um, I think there's a lot of negative stories that we carry. Um, for me, one of the biggest stories was that you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a story that a lot of people carry with them. Um, you go and go to do something for the, even the first time or go to do something new. And the first thing that happens is this story starts repeating in your mind, like it just goes over and over, can you do this? Maybe I won't, I'll fail. I'm not good enough. Do I have the knowledge? And as these stories continue to play, the chances of you actually going ahead and doing it get slimmer and slimmer and slimmer to the fact that you won't do it. Did you find in and during obviously the last three years, everyone's been going through a lot of tough times. Did you find that, that you were more, um, felt more of an obligation to make sure that people were actually receiving these messages? Because it was really yeah. tough times. Absolutely, especially, um, with the videos and because my videos were so um, positively inspired and they were also emotional supports. So when people felt that, they, that it was quite overwhelming or they needed some time to readjust, what they would do is they could jump onto a video and listen to something that was quite motivational and made them feel good. Yeah. So the commitment from me to actually do that, especially when we're through COVID, um, was more so for me because I knew that people were looking for an avenue to go on to and to hear something that was good for them. Yeah. Because yeah. going down that avenue, like I know a lot of people, like I, I've seen it, I have it on YouTube, I've listened to it, that you get those meditation videos, you get like positive affirmation videos to listen to or you see, which are very long, very nice. Um, but where do you feel like you fit in there? Are you going down like the more motivational route? Are you trying to like affirm to people you are good enough sort of thing? Like where, where is your avenue? So my avenue is in actually identifying what beliefs you actually have because um, your negative beliefs and those beliefs that actually limit you are very good at hiding. So they're not in your conscious mind, they're in your unconscious mind. And the way that the videos work is to actually show images, which is how our unconscious mind communicates. We don't communicate in words. So when they see these images and the words that come with these images and the videos, what they're doing is seeing if they relate, if that belief or that thought or that pattern is actually part and parcel with who they are. They're starting to identify with that because a lot of the times we have um, beliefs that we don't even know we have. 
So unless we can look at how they're stopping us, we will never know to do anything about it. Yeah. You can find more of Deborah's work on thoughttemple.com and in her mental health and wellbeing art gallery opening soon in Cremorne, the first of its kind. Last week you all hopped online and scored the film using our super effective wondrous scoring system, the Cutting Room's 5E voting system. So let's take a look at your feedback on the long format. So if we start to see our scores here now, last week the panel voted when I was sick, 76 for film. If I was here, it would have been way higher because I love films. But 98% <laughs> the audience got right involved. Five on enrichment, four on engagement, four then on evolve positively, factually educate four, and entertain obviously a five. It is film. So what we're starting to see here is some really great sort of positive media types for you guys at home to, if you are having trouble with media, Look at, look at your radio, look at your podcasting, look at your films, I'm sure they'll sort you out. Now it's time to give YouTube its 5E medicine. What are the 5Es I hear you say? They're what makes the media tasty and nutritious. Does it enrich you? Does it educate you? Does it promote community engagement? Does it entertain you? And has it evolved positively over the last five years? Sarah, enrichment, YouTube. Absolutely enriching, I love it. Um, I can't get enough of it, you know, music, uh, little web series, whatever. There's just so much content on there to enjoy and it's enriching. I'm going to give it a three this week, mainly because there is a lot of content out there that does make me angry, but I'll just change the channel to something else that doesn't. I'm going to give it a five because you have personal choice. There is so much on uh, YouTube that you can find whatever it is that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give it a three. I don't know... It Right now, I think I'm I'm in a YouTube rut right now, so I think that's the only reason. But I don't feel super enriched right now by YouTube, if I'm honest. Uh, education does it factually educate you, Sarah? Yes, absolutely. If I need to find something quickly, I'll jump on YouTube and find a how-to video. Simple as that. Uh, that is a four from me as well. It is really about educating for me. If I if I also can't find something, I go straight to the YouTube. They'll know. Mm. And it's a four for me because it is a how-to platform. Anything you want to know, just look it up and you'll know how to do it. Mm. I would also give it a four. I'm not looking to be educated. I just know that it's there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just there for the good times. Um, but I know there's educational stuff on there. Community engagement. Sarah, where are we at? I don't believe it creates a lot of community engagement, except perhaps maybe through the trolls in the comments. <laughs> I'm going to give it a three as well because it is a way to learn more about certain communities but I don't see them engaging necessarily with the communities. A lot of people say, you know, check out the comments but they're always pretty nasty. I'm also going to give it a three. Um, the community you're, you engage is actually your own audience. Mm. Um, so for that reason it will get a three. Yeah, I'm only going to give it a two. I know a lot of YouTubers are going for the whole, you know, we're a, we're we're all friends together, me and you here, and you've got your comments and things. I just I don't know if I feel particularly taken in by it sometimes, you know. So it only gets two for me. Does it entertain you? Absolutely. There's so much great content on there. I'm giving it a five. I am finding my five because I'm giving it a five. <laughs> also, it definitely entertains me on the long boring days when I'm sick or whatever on the couch. And I'm also going to give it a five for exactly the same reason. You can find anything on there. Two. I'm only giving it a four. While it's full of excellent Gordon Ramsay clips for you to enjoy at home, I, as I said, I'm in a bit of a rut. So I'm not fully being entertained right now, but Gordon Ramsay's still very good. <laughs> <laughs> and Lucky Lance, has it evolved positively over the last five years? Uh, I don't think so. There just seems to be a lot more ads on there lately, which really annoy me. I'm also giving it a three, mainly because I think it's sort of stayed pretty steady over the last five years. I'm actually going to give it a four because it's allowed content writers um, to get onto YouTube and mm. it's allowed that more accessible. I was going to give it two, but I'm going to give it a three if you add these together because I accidentally That's a 21. Lost, I lost my three. Um, <laughs> but no, I think it has evolved a little bit in terms of content. I've definitely seen a lot of new stuff on there. But in the grand scheme of things, it does seem like it's stagnated a bit. It's very similar. It's a lot of similar content. So I'm not sure it's gone too far in terms of growth. Well, if we put our heads together, I'm sure we'll all come up with the magical number of 75 
Uh, look at that. 75 <laughs> points. <laughs> well, that's our thoughts on YouTube. And what's your take? Get onto our Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook pages. Is YouTube a yay or an A? Please get your valuable votes in by noon this Wednesday. And that's the show for tonight. Next week, we spread our elbows and unfurl print media. Can something that you swat spiders with fulfill all your modern media needs? Or is it just a large receptacle for Sudoku? Join us next week for the answers. Until then, be mindful of the media you consume. And good night.